Good morning, everyone. Let's all let's all sing together. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. Thy bountiful It breathes in the air, it shines in the light, it streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, in the and welcome to the Grand Strand Church of Christ. We are glad that you are here. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, Curtis and I think we pushed the right buttons and I hope you're able to see us right now. If you are visiting with us uh, from out of town or in town this morning, we are blessed by your presence. We thank you for joining us as we worship the Lord together. You may be wondering where all the kids are. Well, uh, until COVID's numbers go down a little more, our kids go straight to their classes, but hopefully in the nearer future than further future, our kids will be back joining us at the beginning of this service uh, before they go to their various classes. Uh, if you got the e-bulletin, and I hope you did it, you did keep praying for those mentioned on it. I need you to add two individuals to it. Uh, Mike Jeffrey tomorrow is having cataract surgery. Please be in prayer for him. And on Wednesday, Tony Ayers is having a back or spinal surgery. So please pray for him. Notice that the letters for our troops are due back to the building by Wednesday this week. Claire Turberville will then take those uh, and uh, with the organization she's working with, get those mailed off. So if you want to write an encouraging letter uh, to our men and women in the military, do that and get those letters back in by Wednesday. Finally, the cookout and trunk or treat will take place next Sunday after the 1030 service. If you're not planning on staying, but you want to donate candy uh, for others to give out to the kids, that candy needs to be brought to the building by Friday. Everything will be outdoors, the grilling of the hot dogs and, and uh, fellowship fo followed by the trunk or treat in our parking lot. Several years ago, uh, a Christian leader in our country in his blog uh, began by writing this. I have a confession. I don't connect with God by singing to him. Not at all. Our next song will be How Can We Keep from Singing His Praise? It's commanded in Scripture. God loves to hear our voices and our hearts give birth to worship to him in song. And so let's sing his praise as Curtis leads us in this next song. There is an endless song echoes in my soul. I hear the music ring and know the storms may Keep from 
Thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Hazar, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the deep love that you have for us. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful day that you have given us to enjoy and to, to be in your presence. Lord, we thank you for your written word, how it moves us and directs us to you and brings us closer to you. Lord, we just thank you so much the wonderful things that you give us in our life. Lord, as we uh, enter this worship and continue in this worship, Lord, we would ask that you would, uh, you would fill our hearts with a thirst and a hunger for the word that we are about to hear today. Move us with the sermon that we are about to hear. Move us closer to you with it, Lord, whether it be encouragement to edify or to convict. 
Lord, pour out your word among us today and use it as you would to build us up into the image of Christ. Lord, we thank you for all that you do. We thank you for all of your blessings, but Lord, we thank you most for Jesus Christ and everything that he means to us. He is our life and the length of our days, and we will worship him until he comes. In Jesus' name. Would you stand with me, please, as we sing this next song? There is a habitation built by the living God for all of every nation who sing that grand abode. Oh, Zion, Zion, I long thy gates to series on some topics that just won't go away, some topics that the church has gotten wrong at times in her history, and the topic uh, for us to focus on this morning is in fact church. A good friend of mine was raised in the church where if you ever missed a church service, your faith was suspect and your salvation was in jeopardy because you were choosing the world over God. His family never missed a Sunday morning, a Sunday night, and a Wednesday night. And Back in this time when there were gospel meetings, and there were at least two a year, they could last anywhere from four nights to two weeks, and his family would be there every time. As a 12-year-old, he was the pitching star on his baseball team, and the championship game fell on a Wednesday night. His parents refused to allow him to participate in that game and made him go to church. And even well into his adult years, he still harbors some resentment about their decision that night. Well, as you know, uh, we are people that seemingly swing from one extreme to another, and so there's that extreme that he was raised in, and there is the extreme that we're presently living in right now, where many Christians claim they can follow Jesus without any connection to Jesus' church. In our nation, there's still about 7% of Americans who identify as Christian, but yes, than 30% of Americans who identify as Christian who attend a church with any kind of regularity. And so Christians who love Jesus uh, but do not connect with the church are prone to say things like, um, 
I'm spiritual but not religious. Or I like Jesus, but I just don't like the church. And with sentiments like those, especially even among uh, Christian thought leaders uh, in our country uh, who love Jesus but have no connection to church whatsoever, uh, there's no wonder that the church is in sharp decline, not just in America, uh, but throughout most of the world. But you know you're in trouble as a local church when, when self-professed Christian leaders uh, have rejected the church and influence other Christians to reject the church as well. So here are some of the common reasons for why uh, Christians say they don't go to church. Number one, I can practice my faith in other ways without having to go to church. Well, I certainly hope all of us practice our faith in many ways uh, that are not connected to the local church, but what they're saying is, I can worship alone or with my family, and that is a valid replacement for worshiping with the local church. Number two, they say, I have family obligations on the weekends. And certainly in the course of my lifetime, uh, those family obligations over the weekend has certainly amped up in our busyness and our activity. But, but I would caution us to remember that our first family, according to Jesus, is the spiritual family. Jesus said, who are my mothers and my brothers? They're my disciples. And so while we have physical family obligations on the weekends, I would say we also have first family or spiritual family obligations on the weekends that are important to remember. A third Christian say, I can't find the church I like. Four, I've been hurt by the church. And I don't doubt the truthfulness of that story. Many Christians have been hurt by a church, just like many Christians have been hurt by family members and been hurt by co-workers and, and by community members. But do those hurts thus uh, necessitate and justify a disconnection from any of those who have hurt us. I think we should think long and hard about that. Number five, uh, people say I have to work on Sundays, which I am empathetic towards for sure. In fact, in our church history about 15 years ago when we had about 10 church members here who worked every Sunday and couldn't attend any of the services that we had on our schedule, I started an 8 a.m. service because they wanted to worship at some time on Sunday before working all day Sunday. And so 8 a.m. back in the day was the early bird special. And uh, several of us would gather for worship. And then this, the sixth reason, this is not necessarily in kind of priority or order. The sixth reason why Christians uh, don't go to church is, I just like the sermons. Yeah, I get that. Um, I often leave here on Sunday morning not liking the sermons uh, I preached. In, in addition to that comment, they say I can get better preaching on a podcast than I can in my local church. I, I can't argue with that as well. I usually listen to someone during the week on a podcast preach to me. And uh, I would just ask us to consider if the quality of the sermon is really the point of church life the beginning and end of church life. So there was a time when the word unchurched referred to unbelievers, people who didn't follow Jesus. But now the word unchurched can also refer to Christians who simply have rejected the church. And as a result, many Christians are living in isolation from each other. Now, I've, I've told you this many times before, so here's your test question for the day. You fill in the blank, all right? The enemy's plan is isolation. God's solution is connection. I think a couple of you get an A plus. I'm not sure about the rest of you. Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm just not preaching good enough. But anyway, uh, that story is as old as the Garden of Eden where the enemy isolates Adam and Eve from God. 
And the enemy isolates Adam and Eve from each other. And he's been trying to implement that plan throughout humanity ever since. Isolate, isolate, isolate. Now the sad part of that story is that the enemy's plan is now winning in the Christian community. Where Christians are more and more isolating from each other by rejecting the local church. So this morning I'm going to take you to 1 Peter chapter 2. If you've got your Bibles, it's a good thing you're going to want to open there because the words of 1 Peter 2 are hard to follow if you're just listening to them as I read them to you. You may want to underline a few words in your Bibles as we go through 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to start with verses 4 through 8 and work on those together. As you come to him, that's Jesus, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, that's Jerusalem, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him, that's Jesus, will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, quote from the Old Testament, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. And another quote from the Old Testament, a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Okay. If you're listening and reading closely, you notice that God is building something, right? And we, we already know that God is a builder. In Genesis 1 and 2, God builds creation. Beginning in Genesis 12, God begins to build a nation called Israel. And God builds that nation through the centuries to be the incubator for the promised king who will come, defeat death, and establish his eternal kingdom. And that eternal kingdom, right now here on earth, is what God is building according to 2 Peter chapter 2. It's called, did you underline it? A spiritual house. As opposed to a physical house. And that spiritual house in Scripture is simply called the church. As Jesus said in Matthew 16, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So Jesus is all about building his church on this planet. And on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, that's exactly what started happening. The birth of the church. About 3,000 were baptized in the Christ that day. And the end of Acts chapter 2 says, And the Lord added daily to their number, as the church, those who are being saved. Now the Apostle Paul got God's vision of the local church. Because he spent all of his time on his missionary journeys planning local churches in the cities and towns that he visited. And so here in 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter is talking about the church when he talks about God building a spiritual house. And so Peter's going to tell us how God builds it. He builds it first with what is called the living stone. Now Peter likes that word living. He's used it twice in 1 Peter chapter 1. He talks about our living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. At the end of chapter 1, he talks about us being born again by the living word of God. And now he's talking about this building, but it's a spiritual building. And it's built first and foremost with this living stone. This living stone breathes and it feels and it loves we're not talking about an inanimate object here. We're talking about someone who is alive, someone who has conquered death and lives forever. We're talking about Jesus here. And in verse 6, as, as Peter jogs his memory back to the Old Testament, he remembers how in the Psalms and Isaiah, Jesus was called the chosen and precious cornerstone. So you know me. I know everything there is to know about masonry and construction. Not 
But here's what I know is, as Peter uses this physical image of building a house and masonry uh, about what God's building in the church. The cornerstone is the first stone set in the construction of a masonry foundation. All other stones will be set in reference to this one stone, thus determining the position of the entire structure. You don't have to be a masonry expert uh, to get the word picture here. God builds a spiritual house with Jesus in a particular place, the cornerstone, and everything else is built around Jesus and connected to Jesus. This building will not last, it will not stand without this cornerstone named Jesus. Now the sad part of the story, as again Peter rejogs his memory of the Old Testament, is that according to verse 7, the stone, quote, Jesus, the builders, Israel, rejected, has become the cornerstone. God's people, that nation he built called Israel, said, no, we don't want Jesus. We're not building anything around Jesus. It was an emphatic no, by and large, to Jesus, while God at the same time is saying, he is the precious and chosen cornerstone. Now, anything in life that isn't built on Jesus Christ will eventually collapse upon itself. Maybe not right in the here and now, but eventually, over time, definitely at the end of time, everything in our lives that isn't built on Jesus Christ will collapse, is doomed for destruction. A few years ago, a good buddy of mine was explaining to me why his first marriage failed before he came to know Jesus Christ. And I was expecting to like hear some of the usual explanations for why a couple's marriage fails. I was expecting him to say, we just had poor communication, or uh, we couldn't agree about finances and money, or the in-laws. They were a thorn in our flesh. We couldn't do it anymore. Or irreconcilable differences. That's why our marriage ended. He didn't, he didn't give me any of those. This is what he said. He said, my marriage failed because Jesus wasn't a part of it. There you go. And what scripture is saying is that everything in our lives will fail at some point in time if Jesus isn't a part of it. The spiritual house will fail if Jesus isn't a part of it. So God begins to build the spiritual house with Jesus and then according to verse 4, he adds what Peter calls living stones. Jesus is the living stone and God adds to it living stones. Who are the living stones? They're followers of Jesus Christ. They're Christians. People who say yes to Jesus Christ. And notice as this building is being laid out, all of these living stones are deeply connected and intertwined with each other as they're all connected to Jesus Christ. They're not out in Mandy Pandy land, one doing his own thing here and another doing his own thing there. No, they are all together connected as one. And they function, according to verse 5, as a holy priesthood that offers spiritual sacrifices to God. Now, you don't have to be an expert in the Old Testament to see the imagery here. But the nation God built, Israel, had one tribe that served as priest, the tribe of Levi, and they offered physical sacrifices to God on behalf of everybody else. But we're talking about a spiritual house now, not a physical one. And every Christian is a priest in the spiritual house. You don't need anybody between you and God but Jesus Christ. No other man is essential for you to have a deep abiding, close relationship with the Lord himself, okay? Because you are a priest. And you function as a priest who offers, what? Spiritual sacrifices. Instead of the physical ones, the tribe of Levi offered those animal sacrifices, you offer spiritual sacrifices. Well, what is that? It's you. Your whole life. Everything about you. Everything that is in you. You offer to God. Romans 12.1 says, Offer your bodies or lives as living sacrifices. And so now we have it. The spiritual house that God is building. What it looks like. Question. 
Does that include participation in a local church? I mean, folks who say I'm spiritual or Christian, but not religious or a part of the church will say, I, I'm a part of the universal church all over the planet, just not a part of any local church. Two things come to mind for me. Number one, I just don't think that's possible. Logically speaking, um, many of you know I'm a member of the Surfside Rotary Club. And it's just not possible to be a member of Rotary International without being a member of a local Rotary Club. It just doesn't work that way. In the same way, I have a hard time imagining it's, it's possibly a part of the universal church, but not connected to a local group of believers, one without the other. Just logically speaking, uh, doesn't seem so cohesive to me, but uh, apart from the logic, uh, I would suggest it's not very biblical to think of being a part of the universal church, but not the local church. I'll give you a few reasons. Now, you know, most of the New Testament was written not to the universal church, right? But the local churches. So if you weren't connected to the local church at Ephesus, you were just a Christian in Ephesus, but not you didn't hear the word of God. Because God's working in the local churches. And Paul told those Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, listen closely, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. He's talking about that local church in Ephesus. And he's saying Jesus bought that local church of believers with his own blood. I mean, the word church means assembly. It's talking about people not living in isolation, but people living in connection with each other. You might say, well, where in the Bible does it say you have to be a church member? Well, where in the USGA rule book for golf does it say you have to be a human being? It's sort of implied, right? In the same way, in Scripture, there's no such thing as an unchurched believer. Just as there's no such thing as an unbaptized believer. They're like one and the same. They go together. But here's just my last thought on this. Scripture tells us in Luke chapter 4 that Jesus showed up at the synagogue, a local synagogue, Every Saturday of his life. Now, are you telling me if Jesus was alive today, he wouldn't show up at a local church on Sunday? Even though he always showed up at a local synagogue on Saturday? I have a hard time imagining Jesus rejecting the local church uh, like many claim they can do. So let me take you finally in the last part of the sermon back to 1 Peter chapter 2. We've seen how God is building a spiritual house with Jesus and his followers. Now in verses 9 through 12, we'll get a little more detail in regards to how the local church functions. Here it is. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people. No connection, right? But now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy. But now you have received mercy. Here's the closer. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds, and they can't argue, argue what they see. They may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So God's building this spiritual house, and the spiritual house plays an important role in the functioning of God's story in the world. So I'll close with like two reasons why I think Christians should go to church. <laughs> and it's not to check a box off, like maybe it was at certain points in church history. Christians should go to church, number one, because they are the church, man. They are the church. So why wouldn't you 
go to church. Because if you are the church, you go to church, not for yourself necessarily. You go for God and you go for others that you were called to serve in church. To encourage and exhort and be present. Be available. In other words, this consumer mentality that has invaded all areas of life has invaded uh, the thought life of the church community as if, you know, church is about what I consume, you know, for an hour and then I'm done. It's not about you. It's not about your taste or, or preferences. It's about God's story being told in the church and how we're called to, to serve other fellow strugglers and disciples who love Jesus Christ. So we go to church to be present and available to God and to other Christians. And number two, we go to church to be available to the unchurched, that meaning the unbeliever. Now you saw Peter saying, the unbelievers are watching you. Their eyes are on you. And it's your role to tell them the true story about God as they look at you. And that's a 24-7, seven-day-a-week sort of job. But we go to church also to create space for the unbeliever in our community. To give them an opportunity to seek if they're so inclined, if God is, is pulling them. Because chances are they're not going to show up at your door at home in your neighborhood. Sometimes we get fortunate like that. But by and large, if you don't know them, where are they going to go, right? If they're spiritually inclined. They're going to go to a local church, and we need to go to church to be available to them, to love them, listen to them, and share Jesus with them. So some of you know I'm a part of the recovery community, have been for years. And you know, when you, when you go to weekly meetings, you run across people who haven't struggled necessarily or given way to their area of struggle in a long time, like... An alcoholic who hadn't had a drink of alcohol for 30 years. A drug addict who hasn't used an illegal drug for 20 years. And sometimes someone will ask him or her, oh, what do you keep coming to these meetings for? You haven't had a fall in decades, man. And one of the answers is, I come for the newcomer, among other things. I haven't arrived in perfection yet. But I also come so that if there is a newcomer who's just getting started in recovery, I can be here to help him or to help her and walk hand in hand together. That's sort of why we come to church as well. To be available for whoever God has brought into our midst. To walk with them as we all walk closer to Jesus. So yeah, the church has gotten some things wrong about going to church. But the church has got some things right. And his plan is isolation. And it's his plan he's been working since the beginning of time. May we be a church that offers connection to each other and to the unbeliever as we love Jesus and worship Jesus together. We're going to offer a song of decision right now. If there's something going on in your life, maybe not even related possibly or probably to what I've been talking about today, but you know you need to ask for prayer before you leave here this morning. You know you can't face what you're about to face this week without people praying for you, without someone else knowing what you're going through and being present to support and encourage you. Or well, if you're someone who's never been baptized into Jesus and received His grace and forgiveness and you're ready for that right now, I invite you to come as we all stand and sing this song together. I'll be waiting for you up front. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a 
before I start talking, I want everyone to understand that when I'm up here, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to us. I'm just as guilty of what I'm about to talk about as anybody in this room. So if you talk to my children or if you talk to any of the firefighters that work for me, they'll tell you that there are two things that I cannot tolerate. Number one is lying. I won't tolerate it. Number two is making excuses for what you did or didn't do. There is no excuse. Either you did it or you didn't do it. Don't tell me why, I don't care. You know, and that's, that's, a, that's a tough way to be, but I mean, I'm dealing with young men and women that are in their 20s, and some of them haven't ever had anybody to, to tell them that. You know, that even though you tried your best, you didn't get it done. You know, if you tried your best and it wasn't good enough this time, you need to work on whatever caused you to not succeed. But that's something you have to look at. Don't come to me and try to explain to me why you didn't do something. So what is an excuse? It's something we use to justify what we did or did not do. Typically, it's used in a negative fashion. That's why I get so aggravated about it. You know, uh, I didn't have enough time. No, you had plenty of time to budget your time well. I wasn't strong enough. Well, you didn't work hard enough to get strong enough to do what you needed to do. I wasn't smart enough. You should have studied hard. It was too difficult. No, it wasn't. I believed you could do it. Why don't you? You know? So, I kind of told you guys what I think about excuses, but I tend to use them myself. So I'm a big old hypocrite standing here. I meant to do that, but I got busy. Or I had a long night at work, had a big fire, I, I needed to sleep for an hour, so I couldn't make it or whatever. And I use them too, and I hate them. I hate when I do it because it's so hypocritical, and I know what I'm doing, and it disgusts me to no end that I'm doing it. But we're all sinners. We all make mistakes. I always wonder what Jesus would say to me if I went up there. He'd like, why didn't you, why didn't you do a better job? Why weren't you a better Christian? Why weren't you, why didn't you set a better example? What am I going to say to that? And if you start talking, he's going to be like, I don't want to hear that. I want to hear your excuses. You can pick up that Bible and read it. He's not a big fan of excuses from anybody. It doesn't mean that he is a compassionate. He doesn't understand that, yeah, I tried. Jesus came and he lived on this earth just like I did. Faced the same things I faced. Faced the same things you faced. He made a whole lot better decisions than I have. I can tell you that. <clears throat> you look at Moses and Gideon. These guys, we all know who they are. They made excuses. Moses is like, oh, not me, man. Not, why are you talking to me? Who am I? I'm, I'm just some regular old guy, you know. Gideon, same thing. I'm like the littlest dude here. And you're going to send me down there to, to take care of this? I can't do that. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. God believes in you. Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself as much as Jesus does. I can imagine sitting there talking to Jesus and him looking down at me and being like, hey man, look at the sacrifice I made for you. And you couldn't do the simple thing that I asked you to do. Love the Lord. Treat your brother as, your, as yourself. Love your brother as yourself. Or your neighbor. What, you couldn't do that? It's not that hard. But it is hard, isn't it? It's really hard to do the right thing. That's why everybody doesn't do it. So if you do the right thing, do the right thing as often as you can because I promise you at some point you're going to do the wrong thing. That's Nobody's perfect. But don't make excuses for it. Say, hey, you know what? I messed up. Stop right there. My kids will tell you, when I hear the word but, I say everything that comes out before the word but is exactly what comes out of them. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> you know, because it's, and I, I don't want to stand in front of Jesus and go, hey man, I'm sorry, but I should have, but I, I, went, I meant to. I thought I had another day. I thought I had another hour. I didn't know I was going to have a heart attack on the way home this morning. I mean, you're standing at one minute, you're here, and the next minute, you're there. Sometimes you don't see it coming. I was 12. I was 15. I didn't know this was going to happen to me. I meant to get baptized. I meant to repent. I'm sorry. I don't know who you are. That's not what I want to hear from Jesus. Remember the sacrifice this morning as we think back about what he did for us. And don't disappoint him. He doesn't ask a whole lot out of us. And... I don't think any matter, no matter what we do, we're not going to live up to what Jesus did while he was here. We're not going to be that good. But be the best you can. 
love each other, help each other, invite people to church, talk to them about Jesus. It's just one of those things where you just do the best you can absolutely do so you don't have to make excuses. As we pray for the cup this morning, think back to Jesus' blood that bought us and, and brought us to, to hope and, and helped us have hope for eternal life. And we'll do a prayer for the bread, and then we'll do a prayer for the cup. Okay. Would you bow me? Father, as we partake of this bread, it represents Jesus' body. I ask you to help us remember what it represents, the sacrifices that were made, and what it means to be a Christian. And Father, I ask that if there's one out there that we haven't reached, please, please let us be able to talk to them. Bring them here. And Father, help us to be good witnesses. Help us to be good examples. And help us to take this in a manner that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the for the church family we have this morning. Father, we thank you for this remembrance, this time of remembrance. We ask that you'll guide our thoughts and our minds. And help us to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Father, that we are no way worthy of being in your presence or in your kingdom, but we are so very thankful for your son that has allowed that to be possible. Father, we ask that we take this in a, in a manner that's pleasing and, and that means something. And Father, we thank you for your blessings on us and all of this church family. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. We who are part of the body share a common love. Let's sing about that now. <clears throat> a common love for each other, a common gift to the Savior, a common bond holding us to the Facebook land. We miss you. We uh, hope you'll be able to join us again soon. Hope everybody stays healthy and uh, stay away from each other. <laughs> um, it is a pleasure to see all of you this morning. And uh, if you're a visitor, please hang around. Let's get to know you. Um, in particular, if you're a local, let us talk to you and maybe get you guys to come see us every Sunday. We would love to have you. It is a, it is a joy to be a member of this congregation. It's a great place. And there's a lot of good people here. And we got plenty of room for a lot more good people. Or even some bad ones. So <laughs> come on, and we'll uh, we'll get you where you need to be. Uh, there are boxes out back. If you guys wish to contribute, out uh, you'll see them on the sides on the, of the aisles on the way out. Um, 
And again, I hope everybody has a safe trip home. We'll see you again next week. And everybody just uh, be good to each other. And uh, if you'll pray with me, we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for this morning. We thank you for the beautiful day that you've given to us out there. Lord, we thank you for all these wonderful people gathered here today. We thank you for the for the love in this room and, and the love out there in, in the world. You know, Lord, there's we tend to focus on all the bad stuff. Sometimes we lose sight of the good. And Lord, we thank you for blessing us with a congregation and a, and a minister and leaders that, that guide us and, and bring joy to us and, and preach your word, Lord. Sometimes it's tough to hear things. And uh, sometimes we're talking to ourselves as much as we are everybody else. And just help our hearts to be open, our minds to be open, to put Jesus first and remember to sacrifice that he made. And understand that he is for everyone. He's not just for Christians, he is for everyone. And Father, we thank you for your blessings in this in this congregation. We thank you for those blessings in our lives. We ask you to please grant us safety and bring us back home soon. Lord, we thank you for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen.